Coming up on Primetime News, Samsung Electronics has something to celebrate in the third quarter, with its operating profit jumping up 82% from a year ago. Koreans can now pay their bills with greater ease as a new online banking system will create an all-in-one method for payments to different companies from different bank accounts. Although the U.S. Fed is holding its key interest rate steady, there are strong signs that point to a rate hike before the year is up. All next, so stay tuned. Hello, it's 10 p.m. on a Thursday here in Korea. Welcome to Primetime News. I'm Daniel Che. We start on a high note. Samsung Electronics saw its operating profit jump more than 80 percent in the third quarter from the year before, driven by strong chip sales and a pickup in its mobile business. Kim Min-ji starts us off. Samsung Electronics' third quarter figures show the tech giant's earnings are on an upswing. The company had an operating profit of about 6.5 billion U.S. dollars in the July to September period, up 82 percent from a year ago. Sales rose almost 9 percent, while net profit also climbed nearly 30 percent during the same period. Currency conditions were favorable in the third quarter. In addition, lower production costs for semiconductors and strong demand for chips under OLED displays used for new smartphones helped drive up the earnings momentum. Samsung's chip business, which has been the company's cash cow, posted an operating profit of $3.2 billion in the third quarter, setting a new record. Its bottom line also got a boost to the tune of about $700 million, thanks to the Korean won's weakness against the U.S. dollar. Samsung's IT and mobile division, which has been weighing on earnings, posted an operating profit of $2.1 billion, an improvement from last year, but still down slightly from the second quarter. Price cuts on the new Galaxy S6 smartphones, released before new Apple products in a bid to avoid direct competition, pushed up the number of handsets sold, but the lower average sale price added into the company's overall profit. Analysts aren't so optimistic about Samsung's performance in the fourth quarter. They say the company's earnings will likely decline in the face of stiffer competition from Apple's new products, as well as seasonally lower demand for components. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Hyundai Motor has reached an impressive sales milestone in the United States. But according to our Kwan Soa, the situation isn't as peachy as for the Korean auto giant in the world's biggest auto market, China. Hyundai Motor has hit sales of 10 million in the U.S., reaching an important milestone in its combined sales since its entry into the market 29 years ago. Hyundai Motor America said Wednesday that it's thanks to the company's strategic rollout of its product line in the country. Hyundai entered the U.S. market in 1986 with a subcompact XL, which became an immediate success, selling over 100,000 units in just seven months. The champagne might be on hold, though, as Hyundai Motor's popularity in China appears to be on the wane. For the first time in six years, Hyundai's ranking in terms of sales and other factors has dropped below a Chinese automaker. For the first nine months of the year, Chang'an Automaker was ranked fifth behind several General Motors and Volkswagen branches. Hyundai Motor dropped one spot to sixth. Industry watchers say that as Chinese cars gradually get better, Korean car makers will suffer the most as their brand value and overall image lags behind that of European and American automakers. The primary reason why Chinese car competitiveness is on the rise is that they are half the price of Korean cars. But what's changed from the past is that Chinese automakers have enhanced their quality and safety standards. Although they have yet to reach the level of Korean brands, a recent study shows that quality-wise, the number of Chinese cars that had problems three months after being sold has dropped from 834 in 2000 to 155 in 2013. Experts say that small SUVs are currently a hit in China, so Korean automakers should be looking to launch new models targeting that auto trend.
Another tactic would be to maintain the high quality and high technology, reduce prices, and then raise them once Korean brands recover. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. The Korea Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank of Korea announced plans to save Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering by injecting a vast amount of cash. Lee Ji-won looks into whether it will be more than just a quick fix. Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering, Korea's second largest shipbuilder, will be supported by a vast amount of money from its creditors. The Korea Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank of Korea, also known as Korea Exim Bank, will pump in roughly 3.7 billion U.S. dollars to the company. The fund will be used for recapitalization and liquidity support, and the plans to decrease the company's debt ratio from 4,000 percent to 500 percent by the end of next year. The aid will come in exchange for the shipbuilder's selling of non-core assets, cutting down wages of executives by 10 to 20 percent, and downsizing some 300 manager-level officials. The company will also be pushed for privatization. After the two sides sign a memorandum of understanding by next month, the rescue funds will be gradually injected. As costs from the delayed construction of offshore facilities increase and orders are canceled, Korea's shipbuilding industry has been suffering from a few years back. The country's second largest shipbuilder recorded an operating loss of over 3.7 billion U.S. dollars in the first three quarters of this year. However, experts doubt these measures will be enough. Ship orders are expected to be more stagnated next year, and such uncertainty is a negative factor. Creditors, on their part, believe they'll see operating profits starting next year, putting Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering's bailout under close watch. Lee ji Arirang News. A new banking system in Korea will allow people to easily switch their transaction accounts from bank to bank via an online portal. Our Oh Soo Young fills us in on the so-called Money Move system. Paying your bills can be a monthly hassle when you have multiple credit cards from different banks. But starting Friday, a new banking system will make all of these transactions much simpler. Korean banks are launching a new online portal that aims to simplify the way users switch their payment accounts for recurring transactions. This means customers will no longer need to call individual card companies and other creditors to change their payment accounts. Now all it takes is just a couple of clicks. Adopted by 16 banks, the service is also available for transactions with major billing companies, including telecommunications and insurance firms. And starting in February, the service will be expanded to include utility companies. This is the first financial system in the world to allow different banking institutions to be collaboratively managed. Ahead of the launch, local banks are competing to capture part of the market, which is worth over 7 billion US dollars in annual transactions. It's important for banks to gain accounts with low-cost deposits because those accounts sweep in significant profits. So with this new system boosting the market-based competition, banks are providing more benefits for customers, creating a win-win situation for everyone. The list of benefits includes loyalty points, zero transaction fees and lower interest rates for credit card purchases. However, experts say that banks could suffer losses if customers switch around their main transaction accounts just to reap the benefits on offer. Young, Arirang News. As expected, the U.S. Federal Reserve has left its key interest rates unchanged, but it gave its strongest indication yet that it will pull the trigger and raise rates in December, prompting concerns on the part of Korea. Yi Soo-eun reports. The U.S. Federal Reserve held interest rates at near zero once again, but it has sent a number of notable signals that a rate hike is possible in December, the last chance it will have to raise rates this year, prompting concerns about the effect on the Korean economy. Those concerns were reflected in Korea's financial markets. The benchmark Kospi took a beating on Thursday to close at 2,030, down 0.4 percent from the previous day, while the Korean won fell sharply against the U.S. dollar to 1,141. If the U.S. raises the key rate, foreign investors will pull out of the Korean stock and bond markets, and there will be a downward pressure on the Korean won. Another analyst from the LG Economic Research Institute says the impact on the local economy will be limited. 
The Korean won isn't very strong right now, and we're not dependent on raw material. So compared to other emerging markets, we're not as vulnerable. For the first time, Fed policymakers clarified that they would make a decision at their next meeting on whether to raise rates. They pointed to, quote, solid rates of growth in consumer spending and business investment while eliminating a reference from their previous statement warning a global economic slowdown could sap U.S. economic strength. Lee Soo-in, Arirang News. In Korea, the top 10 percent of the population owns two-thirds of the country's wealth, while the bottom 50 percent holds a mere 2 percent. What's worse is this gap is widening each year. Son jung in runs the numbers for us. New data released by economics professor Kim nak at Dongguk University shows that the share of wealth held by those in the top 10 percent of the population reached 66.4 percent in 2013. That figure is a slight increase from the average of 63.2 percent recorded between the years 2000 and 2007, right before the global financial crisis. Two years ago, to be in the top 10 percent, you needed at least 196,000 U.S. dollars in assets. The assets held by the top 1 percent also rose from 24 percent to 26 percent during the same period. In contrast, the bottom 50 percent have seen their wealth drop, more evidence of Korea's growing wealth gap. Yet the disparity isn't as great as in other countries. The share of wealth held by the top 10 percent in Korea was far lower than in major economies like the U.S. and the U.K., which was 76 percent and 71 percent during the same period. The report also shows that rate of increase for profits from accumulated assets was faster than the rate from employment income, proving that money can make more money. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Defense ministers from South Korea and the United States are set to meet in Seoul on Monday. Topping the agenda is, of course, North Korea, and then there are other regional security issues as well. Kim Hyun bin tells us more. U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter will be in Seoul on Sunday for talks with his South Korean counterpart, Han min Koo for the annual 47th Korea-U.S. Security Consultative Meeting. South Korean Defense Ministry officials say that the two will conduct a North Korea threat evaluation that includes the regime's ongoing development of submarine-launched ballistic missiles and its nuclear arsenal, as well as ways to deal with the North's missile threats. The U.S. is also expected to support South Korea's development of a homegrown missile defense system slated for completion by the mid-2020s. Regional security is also on the agenda for the meeting, and in particular trilateral defense cooperation between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington. The two officials will also examine the mechanisms underlying their agreement to transfer wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul in 2025. Both Han and Carter will head to Malaysia on Monday for the third ASEAN defense ministers meeting on regional security issues. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. The National Assembly urged the government to move the Korean fighter experimental project forward. Chung doo the head of the Parliamentary Defense Committee, said boosting transparency is how funds for the project are being used to develop core technologies and pursuing technical professionalism are key to the project. He also suggested signing partnership contracts with foreign companies. The $16 billion project came under fire after the U.S. decided not to transfer technologies key to the fighter jet project's development back in April, information the government did not reveal to the public until last month. The project was launched to localize production and replace 120 aging combat jets starting in 2025. Meanwhile, the parliament approved $58 million for next year's project. Opposition party leader Moon Jae-in is proposed the government slow down its procession toward creating state-authorized history textbooks for secondary students. He was met with a very aggressive response from the ruling party. Park Ji-won shows us the over-the-top reaction. The proposal by New Politics Alliance for Democracy leader Moon Jae-in was for the government to put a temporary halt on the textbook plan and create a social commission with history and education experts to examine the government's history textbook plan. 
I asked the president to postpone the government procedures for publishing the state-authored history textbook so that political parties can focus on addressing issues related to people's livelihoods that are piling up. The ruling Senori party was quick to respond with an immediate rejection. In a written statement, the party said the opposition party leader should focus on getting lawmakers to carry out their parliamentary duties, especially the passage of bills related to revitalizing the economy and next year's budget. The party had also voiced its dissatisfaction with the opposition at a regular Thursday morning meeting, making reference to recent criticism from North Korea of the government textbook plan. The main opposition party has freshly claimed the government-led history book, of which not even a single page has been written, beautifies Japan's colonial rule and the nation's dictatorial past. This is a strategy that is only benefiting North Korea. The country is deeply divided on the issue. Following a survey by research firm Realmeter earlier this week, roughly half of the 1,000 respondents said they are against a government history text, while nearly 45 percent said they support it. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. President Bakunet emphasized the importance of the role of women in reunification and promised a better working environment for working women. Hwang sung hee shares with us the president's message at the 50th National Women's Conference in Seoul today. Speaking before some 3,500 female leaders, President Park called for a larger role for women in the nation's efforts to reunify Korea. It's the second time the president has attended the National Women's Conference and comes as Korea's changing demographics show there were more women than men in the population this year. But other figures show it's still a tough world for Korean women. Seoul was near the bottom among its 34 OECD peers when it came to the number of women workers in the second quarter of this year. President Park said shattering the glass ceiling for women is part of the government's job. President Park stressed that a collective internal competence is the most important factor in opening a new era towards a reunified Korean peninsula. Hwang sang Arirang News. North Korea is expected to suffer from the worst food shortage since 2011. That's when Kim Jong-un took power. Experts say the poverty-stricken state will fall 1 million tons short of next year's expected minimum food consumption amount of roughly 5.4 million tons. A severe drought that plagued the North this summer has led to a 10 percent drop in this year's food production levels. Decrease in agricultural imports from China due to sour China-North Korea relations is also believed to have exacerbated the situation. The South Korean government has decided not to declare the country free of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome just yet. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says it will wait until after the last MERS patient tests negative for the disease. It will declare an end to the outbreak 28 days after that in accordance with World Health Organization rules. The patient in question had tested negative for the virus but then tested positive 11 days later. The government had previously announced the de facto end to the MERS outbreak in July. However, the death toll from the outbreak recently rose to 37 after someone who was battling the disease died on Sunday. And now we join Bruce Harrison in the News Center for International Headlines. Bruce, China has been grappling with a slowing economy and it appears that one of the first reforms that will make to spur growth will be represented by more baby strollers, more formulas being sold, more talcum powder, and of course one being the loneliest number, they are going to make changes in Beijing, right? 
Uh, that's correct, uh, and good evening, Daniel. Nothing's official yet, and don't start, don't expect couples to start expanding their families overnight. But China has announced an end to its one child policy. State news agency Xinhua says the state will allow couples to have two kids for the first time in more than three decades. Now, the announcement came at the end of a party meeting today to formulate the country's next five year plan. Officials met to discuss financial reforms and how to maintain growth from next year through 2020. Allowing families to have two kids may help provide the growth stability China's looking for. Experts say the one child policy is outdated and responsible for shrinking China's workforce. Regarding the government's five year plan, experts are calling on Beijing to stick to reforms despite the downturn in growth. They say the economic slowdown can't be used as an excuse to stop or delay reforms. Unexpectedly, China is also targeting environmental conservation as one of its reforms. Nepal's elected its first female president. Parliament voted communist leader Vidya Bandari in office into office weeks after adopting a constitution making Nepal a secular state. After the election, Bandari said the new constitution will work for the sovereignty, integrity and freedom of the Nepali people. It's a matter of great pride for all the women of Nepal who make up 50 percent of the population. The formation of the new constitution meant parliament had to elect a president within one month of opening its session. Bandari defeated Nepali Congress candidate 327 votes to 214. Bandari is the widow of the late secretary general of the Nepali Communist Party, Maran Bandari. After a handful of scandals and suspensions, FIFA's taking steps to elect a new leader. The world soccer bodies confirm seven candidates vying for the presidency. FIFA's holding the election to replace President Sepp Blatter. He was suspended earlier this month and is under criminal investigation. The soccer body's ad hoc electoral committee named the candidates, including Union of European Football Association's president, Michel Platini. Platini was provisionally suspended this month for 90 days. FIFA said his candidacy won't be processed as long as the ban's in force. The election scheduled for late February next year. And that's a glimpse of the world. Have a great night. Hello, I'm E.T. Hen with your latest weather updates. It feels like winter already in the mornings with temperatures dropping down to the lowest of the season again, plunging to 3.2 here in Seoul. And tomorrow the whole nation will wake up to another cold morning with some spots seeing lows below the freezing point. And it started to rain at around 6 p.m. in the capital and it should all let up before midnight. But the brief precipitation will bring down the readings further as a stronger cold front will move in. So the current autumn cold snap will persist tomorrow under sunny skies and it will be even colder in the afternoon with highs only rising to 11 here in Seoul. So be sure to dress in layers and take out warmer jackets. On that note, here are the readings for tomorrow. Seoul will kick off at 3 before getting up to 11. Daegu and Gwangju will rise to 13 and 14 while Busan tops out at 16. And as for the other regions, Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 12 and 16 while Dokdo rises to 10. Cold conditions will reach its peak on Saturday with a low of 2 here in the capital. Then the mercury levels will go back to the seasonal averages by next week. That's all for the weather. Good night. On that very soothing note, we wrap up our newscast for this hour. Thank you for watching.